uh, for me to be here with you all. Um, I really like to uh, be close to the people, and uh, I, you know, especially when I have some display stuff and everything. So, thank you, Pastor, for allowing me uh, to be right down here close to you. Um, my name is Tim Kunkel, and uh, I am one of 3,600 or so missionaries of the International Mission Board that you all, as one of 47,000 Southern Baptist churches all over the United States, support through your prayers and through your giving. I know your church is a very generous church that gives monthly uh, uh, through your association and through the state convention and through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and through the Annie Armstrong offering. And uh, we are able to do what we do because of people just like you uh, who pray for us and who give sacrificially so that we can be on the mission field. We were appointed on the 13th of February, 1990, which means that we have been full-time missionaries, your missionaries, on the mission field now for over 32 years. And uh, it has been a wonderful, wonderful joy for us to represent you all as your missionaries overseas. This morning, my wife is in a church called Emmanuel Baptist Church. She just sent me a picture. You'll notice that I've been taking pictures. Well, I just sent some of those pictures to my son in Japan. And right now in Japan, it is three o'clock, or no, it is, it is noon on Monday, okay? Uh, he's 12 hours ahead, and today he was in a church in, Jap in Japan and sharing in Japanese, and uh, that story, if you want to see more of his story, just Google autistic missionary. If you know what autism is, uh, Stephen was nonverbal at four years of age, at five years of age. He would only parrot back things he saw on TV, like Mr. Rogers or something, you know, talking. But he did not really understand how to use language properly. And today he is very fluent in Spanish, Portuguese, English, and Japanese. Now, Japanese has three alphabets, one of which uses Chinese pictographic symbols and in order to read a book in Japanese, you need to know seven to 10,000 of those symbols. And Stephen knows uh, probably 10,000 of those symbols. He's a very brilliant young man. He has almost a photographic memory. And he loves Japan. He loves the Japanese. And the Japanese love him. And so uh, I guess that video is really showing that God is serious about people hearing the gospel. And he can use people of all races. He can use people of all colors. I mean, I basically see people of one color here. They kind of look like me. Uh, my wife is a quarter indigenous. She's a quarter black. She's a quarter French. And she's a quarter Portuguese. And her great-grandparents were actually slaves in Brazil. And uh, so Stephen uh, is, uh, is one of our sons. And so in order to leave today, I playfully say your ticket out of here is you've got to take one of these prayer cards, okay? One of our family, and then one of our uh, son, and we'd like you to put this on your refrigerator, and every day pray for us as your missionary. So this picture here, it's got a picture of our daughter. She lives in Connecticut. She's married to Matt, and they have our first grandson named Oliver. And he's really excited about us coming. We're going to arrive tomorrow night, the Lord willing, at about 10 o'clock in Hartford, Connecticut. And we're going to then spend about 10 days with him. And that could be the last time I will see my grandson, maybe for a year or two. Not really sure. Uh, in order for us to fly back to Chile, we have to have a negative COVID test. And we have to have a vaccine passport. And without that, we cannot even leave our home. We were in lockdown in Chile for 18 months. We could not leave our house for three months. And uh, so we only met our grandson when he was 22 months old. And then we met our granddaughter when she was 14 months old. And uh, then our son, John, he's the one with, uh, and sitting down in the middle. Uh, if you have Spotify, any of you guys have Spotify, these young guys? No, you're not much into all that? No? Okay, well, you have Spotify? Look up later, look up later, the new division. The New Division. It is, a Christ, it, is, it is not a Christian band. He's a Christian, 
But his music is really to lead people uh, in a non-abrasive way to the gospel. And, and so his band is called The New Division. He had 4.7 million downloads of his music last year. And he learned how to play as an MK, as a missionary kid in church. And so that's our son, John. And so John is married to Elena, and Elena has, or we have one granddaughter named Frankie June, Francis June, and Elena is expecting our third grand, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't, we don't know the gender yet, but we will not be here when that baby is born, and I don't know when we will come back. Probably we'll come back when Stephen graduates from Southern Seminary in May of 2023, which will have been almost five years that we have not seen our son. So that's part of the sacrifice of being a missionary. But I want to have you all take a prayer card of both Stephen and of us. Uh, before I begin my message, let me just say that up here on the front, there's all kind of information, things like how you can pray for 52 weeks for the lost of the world. And uh, so take one of these uh, as well. And then there are these uh, prayer points. For example, this is for May, which today starts. And uh, if you don't get one of these, I would ask you, somebody, to call the International Mission Board. And I would say you maybe need about 30 of these for your church. And then every couple, every family have one. And then you can open it on the day. And so today is the 1st of May. And so here it says, Asian Pacific Rim Peoples. That's where Stephen is. He's in Japan. What is the prayer today? Many Taiwanese believers don't know where to turn after they experience physical or emotional trauma. Pray that Taiwanese people will find hope and healing through trauma healing groups that are facilitated by Taiwanese church leaders. I was a couple of weeks ago with a couple of missionaries to Taiwan. They totally expect mainland China to evade, invade Taiwan by the end of this year. I mean, if, 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 if Russia can do it in Ukraine, why can't the mainland China do it to take back what they consider to be their territory? Okay, so think about that. Think about sitting here today and thinking, okay, in the next few months, this huge military giant is going to invade where I live and I might be displaced. So think about that. So... Please consider calling the IMB and getting about 30 of these per month sent to your church and pray every day as you have your breakfast in the morning as a couple, as your home, pray uh, for all of that. This is all about the Pacific Rim peoples. This is exactly where Stephen is at. So that's for May. So I'm going to leave some of these here. This is a really incredible chart that you might put up somewhere that explains how the money you just put in these plates uh, arrives to the mission field. You see, when you give, a portion of that will go to your association. A portion of that will go to your state convention. And then within 10 days or so, it gets to the International Mission Board. And that is how we are supported. You see, this is called cooperative uh, giving. You know, we, we, we give and we work Together, you are one of 47,000 Southern Baptist churches, one of 12 in your association, that pools together so I don't have to come here as an independent saying, you know, uh, Mr. Joe, will you send $20 a month to such and such a mission board? And, and, and Mrs. Pam, will you do that? I'm not here trying to gain support from anybody, but rather to thank you all for the way that you support us already through cooperative voluntary giving. One other thing, um, really you would be surprised to see the diversity of missionaries. We have many Korean missionaries. We have many Chinese missionaries. In fact, the one who was in Taiwan uh, was born in Hong Kong. I met him a couple of weeks ago and uh, he speaks several languages. And uh, so we have many African-American missionaries. We have many Hispanic missionaries. And we also have special needs people missionaries like Stephen. And so in February, this was per points. And so somebody called me and said, did you see 
the February, and I confess I had not seen it. And, and our son Stephen is featured on a couple of the pages and almost the entire half back page. And so you're, the pastor's wife has a copy of this, um, and uh, you all can kind of read that and share that and maybe take a picture of it and send it out through Messenger or something like that. But um, I didn't even know this, and so somebody told me, and I got it, and uh, it's really imp- imp- incredible. Stephen is here with his well-marked Japanese Bible, and they're talking about missionary with autism opens ministry doors for his team in Japan. So that's really uh, important, I think, um, as you prayerfully support the 3,600 missionaries. And then there is something called the Women's Missionary Union. Have you all heard of the WMU? Okay, the WMU is such an important part of uh, what we do. Women who actively promote missions and GAs, Girls in Action, RAs, Royal Ambassadors, and so on. And so this is a magazine that comes out every month. You might subscribe to this as well. Maybe get 20 or 30 copies of this to the church and uh, make it available. But it also has a prayer calendar. Every day you can pray for different missionaries. And um, my birthday, I almost was born in 58 like you. I was born in 57, but I was born the day after Christmas. And so on these prayer cards that you will take, which once again is your ticket out of here, you got to take one of these. We're going to kind of lock the doors a little bit, block the doors. <laughs> you got to show this to leave. Uh, it says here, Tim, 1226. So that's the day of my birthday. And then my wife's, her name is Ida Sema. She's from Brazil, is 627. And then it's even got our wedding anniversary, 811. On 811, I will be the Lord willing in Guayaquil, Ecuador, by myself, preaching at a huge youth conference in Spanish. I have the beginning message, the closing message, and a three-day evangelism training at this camp. And uh, that's our 45th wedding anniversary. So the dates are right here, so you can pray for us. But uh, so in this magazine that I'm trying to get you to subscribe to, (laughs) on the 26th of December, there it is, American People's Tim Kunkel, Wendy Urbanic. So this is a way that you can pray for us. And then there's all these articles. Somebody wrote me and said, did you see that magazine, Missions Mosaic, for February? And I had not seen it. See, it's hard for me to get this stuff when I'm overseas. And it's got a story about a little church that we helped start in the 1990s. And this is an incredible story. A little town of about 400 people. And today, this morning, right now, that little church will be filled with 10% of the town. There will be 40 people, about as many as are here, in that little church that is about a quarter of the size of this building. Little tiny cinder block church. And somebody sent me an $800 offering. I said, use it however you want it. And so I spent the money to buy all the cinder block, probably 20 bags of Portland cement, most of the rebar, most of the little tin tin roof type ceiling. And we put it all on a flatbed truck and drove it out to this pastor's house and dumped it in his front yard. (laughs) And he built a church in his front yard with that material. I'll I'll give it to the pastor, and uh, you can kind of take a picture of it and then share it later with your folks. But the story is about a little church in Uruguay that gave $500 to the 2020 Lottie Moon Christmas offering. I was at a camp and I was preaching and a lady walked up to me and she says, you know, our church took up an offering for Lottie Moon. And I'd like you to take it and send it to the International Mission Board. And I said, do you mean our mission board or the Uruguay Baptist Convention mission board? She said, no, it's for your mission board. And I says, well, why would you do that? And she said, because... Many years ago, through the Lottie Moon offering, your missionaries built our church. And that's where my parents were saved. That's where I was saved. And this is for you. I said, okay. 
And so she went to her room and came back and had an envelope. And in the envelope, in Uruguay, she had five $100 bills. She had exchanged Uruguayan money, which is about 35 to 1. In other words, you have to use 35 Uruguayan pesos to buy $1. And they had transferred all that money into U.S. dollars. And she gave it to me. And I wired it to the United States. Now think about that. Okay, now I'm a sociologist, okay? So I walk around and I check things out. You know, I notice your pastor has a green shirt and I have one just like that. And I wish that I had worn it today <laughs> because we would look like twins, except he is thinner than me. And it looks like he could beat me in a foot race. He's more athletic looking than me. But I have a shirt just like that. So I walk around and I notice things. You know, I, it almost feels like I'm in Fairbanks, Alaska today. This does not feel like Cairo, Michigan. This is, feels like a hunting lodge in here. So I asked your pastor, take a few pictures. Well, I want to remember this place. But I walk around and I look at things. I mean, I love the living room setting afterward. I'm After church, let's sit out there and just drink some coffee and talk about Jesus in that beautiful you know, setting out there. And I walked around and I saw the stuff from Nine Marks. You know, and you guys are really big into homeless ministry and you're really big into thrift stores and taking care of the poor and, you know... Uh, all of the kids' stuff that you're selling, you know, that you can then uh, give and help people. And I saw this hanging, and I thought, I wonder how many of you have really stopped and read this. How many of you have, and I pulled it off your bulletin board, how many of you have really read this carefully? You know, a lot of times what's on the bulletin boards doesn't, this might even be a Sunday school lesson, to really go through this I'm serious about that. And what a wonderful Sunday school lesson this morning. Thank you, Brother Tim, for your, your work to prepare that. And it's amazing how God uses all of us. And so I was looking at this, and it talks about IMB Global Highlights from the year 2000. You know how the year 2020 started for me? I was in the hospital. On January 1st, I started noticing I was having a hard time breathing, and they rushed me to the hospital. And that had been 45 days after my wife had been in the hospital for seven days and seven nights. And due to the stress and everything that was happening in our life, my wife had to be hospitalized for seven days and seven nights. And then after that, 45 days later, I broke. After just massive travel, constant travel, back and forth, in and out of countries and so on, and we just had to slow down. And then in February, we were at this huge missions conference with 2,200 young people, February 10 through 16. And then in March, the pandemic hit Chile. And we were locked down for three months and could not leave our home for three months. That's why we couldn't come back and see our, our little grandson that had just been born. But you know, it talks about global highlights in 2020. 247 ethno-linguistic people groups and places engaged with the gospel. One of those was in a place called Curva de Moronas in Uruguay. And a little church in Caldwell, Texas adopted that people group. And that was one of the people groups that I was involved in. And then we had another one in Paraguay in a place called Chacoí that also was engaged. And then we had another one. In the highest region of Bolivia, the Afro-Bolivians, in a place called Coripata, Coroico. Those are some of the kunkel numbers right there. Then we had 769,494 people heard a gospel witness. Many of those people heard the gospel witness through the kunkels and the people we mentor. 144,332 new believers. Folks, this was during covid we had some of our best numbers ever in the history of the International Mission Board during the pandemic as people's hearts were open and changed. We had 18,380 new churches planted. Did you all know this? If not, why not? It was hanging on your bulletin board. <laughs> so Tim, you know, Sunday school teachers, you know, use this for one of your lessons in the next month or two. 
We appointed 422 missionaries. We had 86,587 baptisms. That's your baptistry. I like this. The pastor doesn't have to get wet. <laughs> It'd be pretty hard to cover a big guy like me. Pray, pray, pray. And then here's the goals for the next five years. And I'm very much involved in this. We want 500 new missionaries appointed. So we want to get up from 3,600 to 4,100. You know, we appoint some and then these old people keep retiring. My wife will be 72 next month. But we're going back for five more years. She'll be 77 when and if we retire. I'll be 70 almost. We need to mobilize 500 new mission partners. There's a girl from one of our Latin American countries that went to a very closed place. You see, people with a Bolivian passport, people with a Venezuelan passport, people with a Mexican passport can go to places that you and I can't go with a U.S. passport. It's open to them, but not open to us. She was there. She'd been there two years. And about a month ago, two months ago, she was deported and kicked out of the country because she was sharing Christ in this country, a very closed country. So pray for us as we help Latinos and Latinas go to places where U.S. citizens cannot go. Engage 75 cities with comprehensive strategies. Do you know I live in a city of 7.2 million people? I live on the 20, in a 23-story apartment complex on the 12th story, and we have earthquakes almost every day, and our building shakes. I was in the bathtub the other night, and I started noticing the water moving, and we had a 5.2 earthquake. People don't even think about it. It's no big deal. Millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people live around us in apartment buildings that have secure gates, they have doormen, they have cameras everywhere. You can't just go into those places. How do we go into these closed neighborhoods? Look at this. We want to mobilize 75% of Southern Baptist churches to preferably and financially support the IMB. I was in a church in a state the other day, and that church had been planted in 1896. I asked the pastor, when's the last time you had an IMV missionary in your church? And he said, friend, we have never had an IMV missionary in our church. Way at the end of the road. Well, I went way at the end of the road, and I was there, and I shared at that church. And it was amazing, the young people that were there that committed their lives to missions. And that church gave an offering to the Lottie Moon offering last year for the first time. Because why? Because somebody went and challenged them. There has been a historical disconnect between our mission board and local churches just like yours. And a lot of that is our own fault because we just assume people are going to keep on giving even though they really don't know very many of us. You know, I saw your bulletin about your missionary in, in Oaxaca. You know the people in Oaxaca, most of them don't speak Spanish. It's really not even their heart language. They speak indigenous languages. So your missionaries that go there to really reach those people have to learn other languages other than Spanish. See, that's what missions is all about. You know, you, these four young guys, you guys are always sitting together. Are you brothers? <laughs> I know you're brothers in Christ, you're friends. Look at that. What are you going to do with your life? What are you going to be when you grow up? One of you got, a pretty, you got some pretty mean beards going and everything. I don't know how old you are, but what are you going to do? You know, what are you going to do with your life? That's what you got to think about. Huh? Amen. Amen. Be a welder for Jesus. But see, maybe at the end of this service, you'll come and you'll kneel down here at the front and you say, Lord, here I am. You know, I'm 17 years old, I'm 20 years old, I'm 22 years old, and my life is yours, and I'll do anything you ask me to do. Think about that, okay? And I, I don't want to put undue pressure on you guys, but I'm, I, I've been watching you since I walked in the door. 
You know, you guys are some pretty awesome chess players. Um, the president of the Uruguay Baptist Convention is one of my disciples, and his name is Raul Martinez. He went to 10th grade. He never finished high school. He had never been from his little city of Cairo to, say, Detroit. He had never been out of his little town. I took him for the first time. He's traveled the world, and today he's the president of the Uruguay Baptist Convention. And you know what he, you know what he does? He's a welder. I kid you not. There's a video on YouTube called Investing in God Called Men. Now this guy can make anything with welding. But God got a hold of him and now he pastors three churches. He's one of my dearest friends. His name is Pastor Raul Martinez. And he's the president. This would be like the president of the SBC. And he had never been as far as from Carroll to Detroit. And today he travels the world. I'm telling you, man. Okay, so mobilize 75% of Southern Baptist churches. You know, about 60% of Southern Baptist churches give nothing to cooperative missions. And there's a lot of mad people out there. Oh, we're just mad about this. We're mad about that. You know, we get all mad about some stuff. But you do that, and then what happens is missionaries that are out on the field suffer because people stop giving. So folks, we ask you to continue. Look here, increase giving to the IMB by 6% annually. Let me tell you one story, and then we're going to delve into Scripture. Okay, I've been telling you. Well, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. But you know, uh, <clears throat> I was at a church one time in a state, and uh, most Southern Baptist churches, the offering for missions for Lottie Moon ends up being about $10 per attendee, which really is not a very sacrificial giving. And so I saw they had a Lottie Moon goal of $2,700. And there was about 270 people there, so that's about right. And so I spoke and I said, you know what, folks? I said, uh, I saw your Lottie Moon challenge and I bet you there's somebody here that could easily give $2,700 and you wouldn't hardly even feel it. And I said, because I saw your cars out there. You are not poor people. I, I saw some Mercedes and Jaguars and Audis. This was in a place that prosperous. And after I finished preaching, the guy come up and he said, you know, it really touched me what you just said. He said, I could easily give $2,700, wouldn't even feel it. I'm going home, I'm going to get my checkbook, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to just take care of the Lottie Moon offering all by myself. And he did. And you know how much that church gave that month based upon this sacrificial giving of this one fellow? About $13,000. A good four times more than they had proposed. Folks, do you realize that today 157,000, 155,473 people will die without Christ, without ever having heard the gospel? Our whole message today was on Matthew uh, 25. Let's go there for a minute, and I'll get started. Matthew 24, verse 14. If you have your Bible, open it to Matthew 24, 14. And as you find it, allow me to pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity today to be here with this wonderful group of people in Cairo, Michigan. And I pray you'll speak to our hearts. And I pray for these uh, five young men that I see here. I pray for these wonderful families that are here, for the wonderful pastor, that you will open our eyes so that we can see the world as you see the world. And we pray, O oh God, to the Lord of the harvest, that you will call out workers into your harvest field. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's think about what the commission, what the mission of the church really is. Matthew 24, 14 says, 
And people are all thinking about, when is the end going to happen? Are we in the end times? Well, when I was a little boy in Oakland, California, in the 1960s, everybody thought we were in the end times. They were talking about Gog and Magog. They were talking about the big bear of the north that was going to come in and it was going to invade Israel. Russia was going to invade Israel. Atomic bombs. You know, we had, we had bomb drills in our school. All of that. We all thought we were in the end times. And a lot of Christians today feel like we're in the end times. Well, I've got some news for you. We are not yet in the end times. I would say, and I believe with all my heart, that the coming, the second coming of Christ is at least 50 years away. So that means all of us, except these young people, are going to die and have a funeral and, and, and be buried or cremated or something. Most of us are not going to get raptured, so we better just stick with what we're supposed to be doing. And what does it say? Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel, not just any gospel, but the true gospel of Jesus Christ will be preached, excuse me, of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Now your pastor is a Greek and Hebrew scholar and he knows that the words here used by Matthew are the Greek words Panta ta ethne, which means all the ethno-linguistic people groups in the world. And you know how many nations there are in the world? Or ethno-linguistic people groups there are in the world? About 14,000. As we drove from Midland to here, we passed by around 12 churches. There are entire cities in the world in North Africa of 3 million people without one church. Not even one church. So if you had woke up in one of those cities on Sunday morning, you would not see one church. And if you're a believer, there would be no place to go except maybe to huddle in a small group of clandestine Christians. And worship God, hoping you are not discovered. There is a country in Northern Africa where every year I help send a valiant PhD woman from a Latin American country and she goes there. And in that country there are 7.2 million people and there are not as many Christians in that entire country as are united here this morning in this church building. And she goes there. And in that country, a quart of water is more expensive than a quart of gasoline. And she goes in there every year. And I send about $3,500 from a special fund that I can help her with. And she goes there. And she very quietly shares Christ with women in that country. Every time she goes, she comes back sick. It bothers her eyes, all of the flying uh, sand, sand mites, all kind of things. And she goes there and she rides on a camel and she goes way out into the desert and she shares Christ. And here we are as Americans living in this country of freedom and many times we don't realize just how blessed we are that we can have the King James Version, the New King James Version, the ESV, the Holman Standard. You know, some of us have 15 different versions of the Bible in our home. And there are people that have never once heard the name of Jesus Christ. I heard about a, a wonderful Christian believer who was in a faraway place and he was trekking. You know, people like to trek. Trekking is a big thing. You know, you put on a little backpack and you got your little water bottle and that water bottle's got a straw and, 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 and it's got like a bladder at the back of the backpack with maybe four or five liters of water. And whenever you get thirsty as you're trekking, you know, you can suck on that thing and, and you got to get home before you've sucked all that water out. And he was in a place way up in the mountains and he said, you know, I've heard there are people here who have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. And he had a translator with him, and he, so he was asking people, have you ever heard of Jesus Christ? 
And this one guy looked at him and said, Jesus Christ. We said, yeah, isn't there a toothpaste named Christ? And he was thinking of Crest Toothpaste. But he had never heard the name of Jesus Christ. And that tore him up. And he came back to the U.S. And he made a real missions commitment. Folks, of the 14,000 nations that Matthew is talking about here, at least 3,000 of them are what are called unengaged, unreached people groups of the world. I heard a story at a missions conference. It was about a guy who had a son, and this son was hunting and walked too far off into the forest and got lost. He was about 12 years old. And he was out there for two nights, wandering, until they could finally find him. When they found this boy, they asked him, so were you afraid? He said, not really, because I knew the whole town would be looking for me. You see, it's one thing to be lost when somebody is looking for you. It's another thing to be lost, and there is nobody looking for you. See, there's about 2 billion people in the world right now that are lost, and there's nobody looking for them. Maybe one of you guys will be one of those guys. Maybe you. Why am I a missionary? And I'm going to give you four C's, and then I'm going to close. The first word is the word call. If you got a notebook, take down some notes. Four C's, or put it in your phone. Four C's. First word is called. Nobody becomes a missionary if you have not heard the call of God. So those of us that go that you support is because we're called. See, when I was 13 years old, how old are you, young man? You're eight. You're, you're the age my wife was when she got called to be a missionary. Anybody? No, none of you guys are 13. You guys, how old are you guys? 14, 15, 15, 12. okay, 12 years old. There we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom in on you. You look like you're about 16. <laughs> None of you guys look that age. I would have thought you were 20, especially the guy with that massive beard going here. When I was 12 years old, I understood the gospel, Pastor, for the first time. And I was sitting right about where you're sitting, the guy with the little you know, handlebar mustache. I was back there. I understood the gospel for the first time and I knelt and repented of my sins and I was saved. And then when I was 13, I was in a service like this and I heard a message like this. And the pastor said, come forward and kneel down and just simply tell the Lord, here I am, send me, I'm available for whatever. And that day, God called me to the ministry. He called me to missions. And six days later, I began studying Portuguese because the call of God was on my heart to be a missionary in South America. E nesse momento eu não tenho nenhum problema de seguir essa pregação na língua portuguesa. Eu falo bem a língua portuguesa e nunca morei no Brasil. Por quê? Porque Deus me chamou às missões. Did you get that? And six days later, I started studying Portuguese with a retired Brazilian missionary because I wanted to share Christ in South America. If there was a Brazilian here right now, they would be baffled by the fact that I speak very fluent Portuguese almost without an accent because I started studying that language 51 years ago, six days after God called me to missions. E eu hablo bien también el idioma español. Por qué? Porque mi corazón está también con la gente que hable español. See, I speak fluent Spanish and I speak fluent Portuguese. Why? Because the love of Christ has constrained me to the point where I have learned Spanish. I was in a hotel and there's all these Hispanics at this hotel I'm in. So I saw one, he was talking on the phone, I let him finish and then I walked over to him and started speaking to him in Spanish. And he was baffled that this white guy in Midland, Michigan, Como aprendiste a hablar español? Como aprendió? How did you learn how to speak Spanish? I said, well, I'm glad you asked me. And then I pulled out a tract, and I shared Christ with him. 
folks. That's the call of God. The hotel I'm staying in is owned by people from India. So I walked over, talked to this girl yesterday. I said, what's your name? She told me her name. And I pulled out a tract just like this. She says, what is this? I says, well, I know you believe in probably seven million gods. But there is one God. And this one God loved you. And he sent his son to die for you. You see, we can see the Yemeni owners of the gas stations and get mad and say, why are all these foreigners coming over here buying up our gas stations? Or we can walk over to them and say, you know, God has brought the nations right here. And we can walk up to them and say, Jesus loves you. This morning, this young girl asked me, I was by myself waiting for you, Pastor Wester, and she started talking to me. I could tell you her name. I don't want to do that because it's all over the internet. She's 22 years old, speaks several languages, has a BA in business and an MBA from some university, and she's only 22 years old. She asked me, she says, so where's your wife? I says, well, she's upstairs. And she says, so where are you going? I says, well, I'm going out to somewhere out about an hour from here to tell people about Jesus and to talk about Jesus. And, and your wife, well, she's going somewhere else in the city, somebody. And so this lady has become my friend, <laughs> this young girl. And so I give her one of these. And, and, and I, I told her yesterday, I said, you know, my wife looks like she could be your mother. She's the same color as you. And so when my wife came down yesterday, she gave her a piece of jewelry to put, stick right here. You know, I like your shirt, man. It says, just be kind. You know, just be nice to people. Here's a good 11th commandment. Don't be obnoxious. Be nice. You know, last Monday, I was in an airport in Medford, Oregon, in the United Line, so I pull out my credit card, and, and I'm trying, and, and for some reason, the card reader wouldn't read it, and I had to pay $35. And so this lady, who's a nurse from Oklahoma City, whose son just had had a terrible accident, was trying to get out. And I said, no, ma'am. I said, you go ahead of me in line. And she, she was trying, and she was all just flustered. And her son's name is Austin. She said, I got to get home. My son was just in a big wreck. And she's a nurse working in Medford, an RN. So we started talking. And so I said, you're from Oklahoma. I bet you're a Southern Baptist. Yes, I am. I said, well, I'm one of your missionaries. Started talking to her. And they're, they're doing my card. It doesn't work. She says, let me pay for it. This lady paid $35. I said, I want your address. And she said, you're not going to send me any money, are you? I said, well, she thought, I don't want you to send me any money. There's a lot of kind people out there. So I, I, I mailed her several more of these. I told her, tell your pastor how much we appreciate people like you. You know, just talk to people. I went to Walmart this week. And I went there, and I talked to this lady in the photo department who helped me. And she said, pray for my son. I believe he's called to missions. But you know, he got messed up, and he's on probation. But God got a hold of him in jail. And so then I'm coming through the line, and I'm talking to Stephanie. And, and, and there was all this, you know, check. I hate checking my own stuff. So I waited in line, and I get up there, and I said, Stephanie, I said, I'm so glad to see you. I hate checking my own stuff. And I said, I was waiting for somebody like you, like Stephanie, to do it for me. And you sure look friendly, Stephanie. And I pulled out one of these cards, and I said, I'm a, I'm a missionary. I said, I want you to have this. Are you a believer? And I talked to her, gave her one of these cards. And this little lady behind me, an older lady, said, you're a missionary? She said, are you the one, one of those people involved over there at Sunrise? She says, I go to Emmanuel Baptist Church. And my wife just sent me a picture, and there she is. And, and, and I shared Christ with her. She had just moved to Midland from, I don't know, from New York or something. She had a weird accent, like from New York. And she's there this morning. My wife sent it to me and says, look who's here. Wow. You see, there's a saying in Guarani, which is the fourth language I had to learn. 
And it goes like this. There was Paraguayan people here right now, they would be amazed. How did you learn how to speak an indigenous language? Well, the love of Christ constrains me. So I had to learn how to speak Guarani. A little bit different than Greek. Which means, translated into Midlanian Chironian English, means go slowly as you walk like the man taking his pig to market. You can learn a lot from sayings. You see, how do you get a 400-pound pig to market when you are walking the pig to market? Well, you might have one of these rings in his nose and you cajole him along and he goes when he feels like it. It might take you eight hours to walk a mile with a pig. And that's the way I go through life. I go slowly, like a man walking his pig to market. You see, I go on a 10-minute errand to Walmart, and sometime I emerge four hours later. I kid you not. I have been known to kneel down and pray with people in Walmart. Because you never know what people are facing. Don't be in such a hurry that you miss what God is about. The end is not going to come until we finish the work that he has told us to do. So God calls people, and the second C is the word command. There's a command, folks. It's not the great suggestion. It's the great commission. It's the great command. Toda autoridad. Me fui dado en los cielos y en la tierra, por tanto, id y hacer discípulos a todas las, las naciones. There I am in Spanish again. All authority has been given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples of every ethno-linguistic people group in the world, he says. Same word, pantata ethno. And then he says, he baptize them, teach them. So we go and we baptize and we teach and we imperative... Make disciples. That's what we're supposed to be doing. All of us have to be involved in disciple making. All of you young guys should have somebody that is not a Christian that you are trying to reach with the gospel. All of you older folks need to be discipling somebody. You need to cross the room. You need to share Christ. We need to take these... these, uh, these, these folletos, these tracks... And not leave them on the rack, but have them in our pockets. And we go to the gas station, and we see that guy that looks like he's not from around here, that maybe has his hair all tied up in a bun, a Sikh. You walk up to him, and you say, what's your name? Well, my name is Aman. Well, Aman, thank you for your service. What do you mean? Thank you for keeping the bathrooms in your, in your, in your service station nice and clean. Thank you for what you do. That guy probably invested $400,000 to buy that thing. He came from Yemen. Did you know that? And he's, he's not a Christian. Well, show him that Christians can be kind and nice. Tell me about your family. Bake him some cookies. Invite him to your house. And share the love of Christ. God has brought the nations to Cairo, Michigan. So we got the second C, which is the word command. The third C is the word consistency. We got to be at it, folks. We got to be consistent. You see, you get up in the morning and you go down and, and, and it says breakfast. And you go in there thinking it's going to have biscuits and gravy and sausage. And all it is is a hard boiled egg and some muffins and some coffee. And you walk in there and you, good morning. There was a guy sitting at the table this morning. Good morning. How you doing? He couldn't believe somebody was talking to him that didn't know him. Made him really uncomfortable. So where are you from? I'm from Detroit. Well, I'm from South America. Oh, okay. Well, have a good day. That was it. He didn't want to talk to me. The Hispanic guy yesterday talked to me. The girl from India talked to me. And some people won't talk to you. But just be nice. Good morning. How you doing? 
You know, go slowly, like the guy taking his pig to market. Don't be in such a hurry. And if you're not in such a hurry, I mean, see, we're already over time. I know, I'm sorry. Over time. But don't be in such a hurry. Where you got to go? Well, I want to get to such and such a cafe before the Methodist. Well, we're already late. <laughs> Just go slowly. Slow down. We're out in the country. You all look like country folk. You know, we're out in a little town. There's no big hurry. Consistency. Just be at it every single day. People ask me, so how did you stay 30 years on the mission field? Well, because I didn't come home. And there were times when I lost my mother-in-law and my mother in 10 days, and neither of us were with our parents when they died, that we wanted to come home. Guess what? We didn't come home. We came home for the funeral. You see this little thing right here, Pastor? Check it out later. It's a 30-year gold pen with a ruby. You know how I stayed 30 years on the mission field? Because people like you loved us and gave and prayed and supported us so we could stay. And we're headed back in six weeks for five more years. The Lord willing. Consistency. And the last word is the word commissioning. It's the great co-mission. That means we mission together. We go and you pray and you support and you give and you send. And hey, you might even adopt the Kunkels as your missionaries and have a little, I don't know, a little whiteboard and, and have the prayer request. Please pray for Tim. He's going to Guayaquil, Ecuador on the 11th of, 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 of August. Pray for God to use him, you know, to reach all these young people for Christ and send them out as missionaries. You know, maybe you want to adopt the Kunkels. I'd, I'd love it. Co-mission. We mission together. You know, if my wife was here this morning, you know what she would do right now? She would have on a, a necklace that she hand weaves called ladder yarn. Have you ever heard of ladder yarn? Any of you people heard of ladder yarn? It, it looks like a ladder. Yes. Yeah. And it's all crocheted together. And she would now call you up and she would take it off and she would give it to you because you're the pastor's wife. And it's because of you and your pastor and your church that we can stay on the mission field. So we're in this together, folks. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the pastor. I thank you for his wife. I thank you for the folks that are here. And I thank you, Lord, that you are still the God of the harvest. And we call out, Lord, workers into your harvest field. Lord, I thank you for this young boy that was here. Thank you for these young men that are here. Lord, may this be a church that continues to send out folks to missions. Lord, I pray especially for these young men that are here. Oh, God, may today be a day when they simply tell you again, here I am, Lord, my life is yours. Save me, send me, use my best years for you. Thank you again for this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.